And welcome to Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, <coughs> Ethan Allen, and thanks for joining us here on Likeable Science. With me today in the Think Tech Studios is Kirsten Carlson. Hey. Welcome, Kirsten. Welcome back, I should say. Thank Kirsten's you. been on the show before. Kirsten has, is a multi-talented individual. She's a science illus scientific illustrator, undersea artist and explorer, children's book author, illustrator at Fathom It Studios, and she's also the Site Art Communications Manager at Hawaii Institute for Marine Biology. So, no, look, your, your life is busy. I wear a lot of hats. <laughs> I wear a lot of hats. Well, that's great. That's great. Um, you were on before talking, uh, what, this was a year and a half ago or something, I think? Like mm -hmm. uh, talking about an upcoming expedition you were getting ready to, to do to Antarctica. Yeah. And now you've done it, right? I have. And so um, that's, that's going to be a... One of the things we'll talk about, and we're also going to talk about an exhibit that you helped curate and play on and put stuff into, right? Sounds awesome, yeah. Wonder wonderful. But so may maybe to help the audience just a little bit, let's, let's, how did you get sort of involved in the science illustration game? So for me, what happened is I was busy going to grad school to become a scientist. And during that time, back when I was a grad student, I got the opportunity to go to Antarctica. So as a scientist, I dove in Antarctica doing some research. I was supposed to do my thesis there. And because of the experience and because of the people I met, um, because of my background, always being creative, but also very curious, I came back from that trip realizing being a, a researcher or being an academic wasn't going to do what was really important to me. And that is to convey the beauty and wonder of nature to others through the lens of science and art. It wasn't until that trip that I realized how strong that drive was. So mm -hmm. when I got back, I dropped out of grad school at the marine lab mm -hmm. that I was at, which was in California. Mm -hmm. I love it. It's a, it's a place called Moss Landing Marine Labs. Mm -hmm. And then I transferred up to UC Santa Cruz and went into the science communication program. It's a one-year program. It's now at Cal State University Monterey Bay if you want to become a scientific illustrator. And if you want to be a writer, it's still at UC Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. And then straight out of there, I got a job at Monterey Bay Aquarium. Wonderful place, wonderful yeah. place. Yeah, I enjoyed my visits there. Yeah. Excellent. And so, uh, I guess it was in 2017, you, you went, you got, you did go on this expedition. Okay. And so, tell us a little bit maybe about, about that. How, how long was it? How, how big a ship? How many people? What, what all did you do? Sure, sure. Um, if you guys could bring up the image of the map of Antarctica so I can orient everybody that's tuning in. So, when I went to Antarctica, both in 1992 and in 2017, I was headed to one of our bases that's the southernmost accessible, diveable ocean on the planet, and that is at McMurdo Station, which is down at the um, bottom end of your screen. Palmer Station, you reach by boat, and it is a little further, out. it is also accessible to diving, but I was very interested to go back to the place in 2017 that I was in, in as a grad student, and that was McMurdo. So to get there, you fly directly south from New Zealand on military transport. So if you'll give me the next slide. Uh, in 1992, when I went down, I was supposed to study icebergs and how they hit bottom and what they do to the benthic communities, i.e. the animals that live in and on the bottom, uh, when the iceberg hits. And then if you go to the next image, and one more image, sorry, I'm going to skip that for now. This is the military transport that took us down to Antarctica, both similar, similar boat, similar in 1992, and then in 2017, this is 2017. So we fly for about, I think that flight was about six hours, and we are on the Ross ice shelf there. We landed on the ice shelf, and if you go ahead and bring up the next image, You'll see that is me in a parka that we get uh, issued to us when we go to Antarctica to keep us nice and warm. Which you brought along, right? I did bring along. So um, if you'll just amuse us for a second, we're going to show you what this parka looks like. <laughs> amazing, it's, amazing. We all have name tags that you <laughs> okay. remove so we because okay. they all look alike when you're hanging them on the hooks <laughs> for lunch. And it is the best equipment on the planet Incredible. to keep you warm in Antarctica. Yeah. And your other, other bits and pieces that go with this? Yeah, that's great. I will show you the other really important piece because I was out on the sea ice a lot. We were issued these fantastic boots that are lovingly called bunny boots. <laughs> and bunny boots are military issue. And the reason why they're so important is this part of the boot here. I feel like I'm in a shoe commercial. <laughs> 
This part is insulated with felt and foam and air to protect you from the six feet of sea ice that you're walking on. Otherwise, your feet would get really cold really fast. And this little dial right here, if you look from the side, it's a little more obvious. This is a valve that you open and close. So when you're in the warmth of a building, you keep it open, the air flows in. And then when you go out in the ice, you go ahead and close it. Also, when you're up in a plane, you want to have it open because these will explode. <laughs> which I've not had done. So these are the boots we wore. Cool. And those two pieces were what I wore both in 1992 and in 2017, and they work fabulously. Wow. Yeah. Oh, you do need that special stuff when you're in that, you, you, that extreme condition, you right? Do. I mean, your yeah. temperatures were down at what? It's, so Antarctica in the summer, so I was there October, November, and in the summertime, it's really not so bad. It's similar to a winter on the mainland. Okay. And uh, I, if you visit my blog, you'll see that I actually took an image of the first thing I saw every morning for the seven weeks I was down there. Huh. It's a view of Observation Hill, which is okay. a significant landmark in McMurdo Station. And the sun never sets. Okay. It set for about three days when we first got there, and then it was up 24 hours 7. Oh. And so you can see the weather change, okay. and it was variable between zero and about 20 something degrees. Not okay. so bad. Okay. Colder than Hawaii. Right. <laughs> a but, little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. And yeah, being on, a, on an ice substrate, though, I mean, you're, you're uh, that's. Adds a certain chill to the whole thing, I'm and sure. The, the wind is yeah. key. When it was windy, and it often was, that's what brought the chill to sure. the place. Sure. Yeah. So, but so, what, what did you sort of? What were you doing on this on this uh, journey? So the important thing to know about my first trip and my second trip, the first trip I went down as a scientist, right, right. the second trip I went down as a science communicator with the added hat of being a scientific illustrator. So okay. my goal was to dive and okay. collect data, much like a scientist, okay. that I could use as an artist. So what that means is I went down to get underwater, to see the sea life, to see the habitats, okay. to collect as much information as possible possible so okay. that when I got back after the seven weeks, I could use it as reference. So sure. we have some more images. Okay. If you'll bring up the, yeah, that one is a great one to start with. So that is me underwater with all my accoutrements. And this is ice above you? That's what this sort of dark shadows or? Yes. Okay. So the thing about Antarctica underwater, which is really different than above water, is that it's very dark because the layer of sea ice is about six feet thick. And there's a layer usually of snow that comes and goes on top of it, and it makes everything kind of twilighty, murky. Mm -hmm. Not murky, clear, but twilighty. Mm -hmm. So I had a light on just about every dive. And what, you'll, what you're seeing in that image is me with my camera and my dive slate. So mm -hmm. I draw underwater with underwater paper that's plastic and wow. a pencil. I take color notes, and then I will show you in a little bit, I developed something where I would come back to the warmth of the cubicle with a nice hot cocoa and augment the drawings. Mm -hmm. So in this picture, you're seeing the sea ice above me, a crack, which is right in front of me, above me. So that's huh. where a pressure ridge is, where two pieces of ice are meeting and are, are crush, crushing into each other. Okay. And then in the foreground, there's these little platelets of ice that kind of look like snow. And if this were a video, you would see that they are actually going up rather than down like snowflakes because they're ice. Uh, and all that stuff in front of me is anchor ice. Anchor ice is a major feature in the shallows in Antarctica. And it causes a lot of problems for the sea life. If they can't get out of the way or if they're not moving out of the zone, they can get encased in ice and lifted up to the under ice surface, which is not a good place to be when you're a benthic animal. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Cool. Excellent. So that strikes me as being very challenging uh, drawing underwater uh, because you're floating around, you're, you're orienting in different ways, your, your subjects may be moving or floating or sinking, whatever. Yeah. Your, your medium that you're in is more dense than air. And the kinds of things you're wearing on your hands yeah. makes oh, yes. a difference. Oh, yeah. So this is, so in Antarctica, you wear a dry suit, which we will see an image of shortly. This is a glove that is attached to the dry suit, which looks like I can wash dishes in it, but it's not. Inside are three gloves, or two, two inserts. Uh, we've got the thin one. I'll, go, I'll hold it off to the side so you can see it. Mm -hmm. And then we have this one, which is thicker, very visible. Mm -hmm. And the most important layer, which keeps my hand dry, 
1992, as a grad student, I was, I was given wet gloves to wear. And it's much different when you wear dry gloves. Um, my return to Antarctica on my first dive was me squealing underwater at minute 22 because my hands had not yet gone numb, which was typical when I was a 24-year-old down uh -huh. there diving. So I was so happy. <laughs> and it is the cold that stops, that stops you. Uh -huh. I very rarely ran out of a tank of air. Uh -huh. It's always, I'm getting a little cold. I need to be safe. I right. need to be warm again. So I'll go and back to the surface. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. I'd imagine hypothermia must be a real constant threat there. If I didn't have the equipment, right. absolutely, yeah. that would set in lickety split. But yeah. because of all the gear, right. I was pretty... But still, pushy. after some time, it's going to be... Yeah, yeah, yeah. it can okay. be a problem. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. So um, maybe we'll go to more images because that... They, they're illustrating what, what, what you're talking about, right? Yeah, so let's bring up the dry suit. There's, so that's okay. perfect. So th this image of my dry suit is a, is a watercolor sketch I did before going down, and it is my ode to my dry suit. Why I love my dry <laughs> suit, because I am not a penguin. <laughs> and in Antarctica, the ocean temperatures are uh, 28 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 2 degrees Celsius. So if you have a glass of ice water in front of you, it's actually colder than that glass of ice water. Right, because it's salt water. Because so it's salt, right, salt so water, yeah. It's colder without freezing. Yep. But that penguin there is wearing his own dry suit, right? He is. <laughs> he, he or she is, right. for sure. So my dry suit was custom made for me in my favorite color, which happens to be blue. When I was down there as a graduate student the first time, I had a hand-me-down that leaked. This dry suit seals me in from neck and with the gloves attached to toe. And the only part of my face exposed is right around my mouth where the regulator, regulator goes. It never leaked on me. Mm -hmm. And I just... It, I love it still to this day. Huh. So the third thing on there is I can pretend to be a penguin while diving in it, but I do have to say that above water, I do feel like the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. <laughs> and when you're diving in Antarctica, there's so much equipment that you have to have an assistant help you don it and mm -hmm. doff it. And also the dive is usually shorter than the time it takes to prep and get your tank together and everything. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I'll imagine, yeah. Oh, so sounds like an exciting life, very, very different. So what, what was a normal day like there when you were down there? So a normal day was one or two dives were planned, depending on the conditions and scheduling and everything, as long as the weather was good. Right. So the weather rules all down there. Okay. And there were days because of weather that we couldn't go out or we needed to wait and to, to see if it cleared. Okay. And then um, we would go have breakfast, which has, it's a dining facility, mm -hmm. so you don't have to cook your own. You right. just show up. It's pretty cushy, mm -hmm. <laughs> pretty good food. And then you would go to the dive locker if it was a morning dive, probably a little bit of time to get a coffee or to check email. And we'd go get our gear together, and we'd go out on the ice in a vehicle. We didn't have mm -hmm. to walk out on the ice, and we'd put all our gear in the vehicle and then go to the hut, which is on the ice with oh. a hole in it, okay. and then we would do our dive. Okay. And then usually, if we were close to McMurdo Station, we would go ahead and come back for lunch, and if we had an afternoon dive, we'd mm -hmm. do it after lunch. Okay. It was, it was oh. eat, sleep, dive, eat, sleep, dive oh. is great. Okay. Cool. And then if we were further out, if we were traveling in, in the transports on the sea ice for longer than an hour, we do back-to-back -back dives with a break in between at what's okay. called a surface interval. Sure. And we'd usually try to do two dives at location, mm -hmm. and it was fantastic because we'd bring our lunch with us and mm -hmm. get to hang out in, on the ice and look wow. around and warm up. It was fantastic. Huh. I did a total of 33 dives while I was there this time. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. That, that sounds super, sounds super. Um, so I tell you, we're probably going to explore a little more in your uh, as the details of your dive and what, what you did and what you produced there and all that kind of stuff. But I believe we have to take a little break right now. So um, we'll be back in one minute. Kirsten Carlson is with me here in the Think Tech Studios, and we're talking about science, art, beauty, and nature. We'll be back in one minute. Aloha. This is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at 3, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. We welcome you to tune in, and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there, and we have an awesome uh, studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you 
tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan the Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. And welcome back to Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today in the Think Tech studios is Kirsten Carlson, scientific illustrator, undersea explorer, artist, uh, book author, uh, sci, sci art communications manager, all, all these multiple hats she wears. And we were talking earlier about the, uh, your trip to Antarctica uh, that you did in 2017 and the dives you did there under, under the ice and the illustrations that you, were, you were making. And uh, it, it just sounds like a really fantastic experience. Uh, wonderful blending, seeing you're, you're, you're illustrating and, and sharing some of the beauty that, that is very inaccessible to most people, right? Underwater in, in Antarctica. Um, but you also saw other things around on the surface, penguins and stuff like that. And I think we have a, an illustration that shows some selection of your art. Yeah. So I'm going to share this with you today because it shows you how my first trip to Antarctica inspired me in many, many ways and why the second trip is the perfect partner to that first trip. So bear with me. I will just run you through with little verbal captions of what you're seeing on screen right now. So in the upper left is a field sketch of an emperor penguin. And it's the largest and furthest south dwelling penguin on Earth. This penguin is one that I saw on my first trip to Antarctica and second trip. Their site where they raise their young is right around the corner from McMurdo Station. We didn't visit, but I waved <laughs> as we flew over. Uh, the emperor penguins, the penguins are something we see on the surface, not underwater while we're diving, because they usually hang out near the sea ice. And all my diving took pl place well within the sea ice edge. And it was in areas they wouldn't dive. They like being near the open ocean. Right. So the middle one is where the land and sea meet, which is an interactive activity book that highlights different intertidal zones around the world, including Antarctica. And I worked with scientists because of my science background and my marine science background in particular. I did the design work and the illustration work for this book. It's available through Alaska Sea Grant. And it highlights all the animals you can see in the inner title. Wonderful, wonderful. The third one over is Sea Secrets. That's another nonfiction book done with scientists for the public, for children. And it's a great book that talks about two long-term ecological research projects that our government is funding through the National Science Foundation, the same people who funded my trip in 2017 to Antarctica. Sure. Yay for NSF. Yay for NSF. <laughs> and Sea Secrets ties together these two long-term ecological research trips, at, sorry, projects in California and in Antarctica with their the krill, which I don't have an image of, I'm sorry, but it is on that cover, and how the animals pictured in there feed off the krill and how mm -hmm. interdependent all those ecosystems are and what's right. happening right. as time passes to those relationships. Right. Krill, in some sense, are sort of the basis of a lot of the food chains they, in the ocean, right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I don't find them tasty, but... <laughs> And then we're going to continue clockwise. So down in the middle there is a ch children's type illustration of a not real thing that I wish could happen is an Adelie penguin making a snow angel. That trail though by his flipper is a toboggan trail and they do actually make those. And I saw that for the first time in 1992 mm -hmm. and was blown away by just watching them skid over the sea ice in a very speedy mm -hmm. motion on their bellies. Mm -hmm. 
The lower right is my logo, which I think we should at the beginning. The middle one is Waddell Seals, and the reason I want to spend a second on them is they are the furthest south marine mammal on the planet. Huh? They do dive where we're diving. They huh? are the only marine mammal that really can overwinter underwater in Antarctica. Huh? And what's fascinating about them is that they make these amazing calls. If you do a search online and do Waddell Seal audio, you will hear their very sci-fi-like calls, and we may not see them every dive, but we definitely hear them every oh, dive. Interesting. The sound travels very well in yes, the water. Yes, yeah. yes. And then in the bottom left-hand corner, that is a pycnogonid, which is commonly called a sea spider, though not mm -hmm. a true spider. Right. And they are very large. Down in Antarctica, they can get as big as your hand. Everywhere else on the planet, like around here in Hawaii, they would be the size of your fingernail on oh. your pinky, probably. Oh. So that's my mitten hand from 1992, which is a wet glove and a sea spider on top. The middle is a logo, so I'm a graphic designer and illustrator, um, and the science background of mine all has resulted in all these all these projects. Wonderful, wonderful, yeah. great, great, uh, nice, nice sampler as it were there. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful. So, um, what what did you what did you sort of take away from this? What did what did you get out of it? So what I got out of it is an amazing amount of inspiration that will last a lifetime. Okay. And in 92, when I went the first time, I really came back with the idea that Antarctica helped reveal to me my true calling, which is this foot in science and foot in art. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to spend the rest of my life, along with all the other creative projects I'm pursuing and the hats I'm wearing, mm -hmm. sharing this inaccessible underwater environment with people through the lens of science and art. Excellent, excellent. So you created illustrations of various sorts, types, and varieties. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we have some more of those. We do. So if you'll bring up what's, what is yeah, that one, you are awesome. So the underwater field sketch here, this is a sample of some of the quote unquote raw data I collected while I was underwater. So this is something you would have drawn basically, the main parts at least. This is, this is a finished augmented okay. drawing. Okay. So the writing for sure was done above water right. without a glove on. The color is watercolor and it also was added as I was sipping cocoa in my cubicle. But the drawings, about three of the drawings on the page are done underwater and then I would come back up and the habit was to come back up and then add notes so I would remember. If you look in the upper right hand corner, you'll see that the dive is actually listed. This right. was a dive at a place called the Jetty, which was very near McMurdo Station. It happened to be our primary dive site. It was done on um, October 27th which was a Friday, mm -hmm. and this was a afternoon dive, it looks like. I, I can't quite right. read that, but you viewers at home can see it. It was a 55-foot dive for 40 minutes, which was a little shallower and a little bit longer than my average dive. My average dive was about 70 feet, and my time was probably around 36, 37 minutes. Okay. And then this was dive number three, so this was very early in the process, and it wasn't until about, this was a seven-week trip, and it wasn't about until about week four, that I decided that I needed to start augmenting my drawings because my drawings underwater were pretty primitive. Right. But the reason you draw underwater, or the reason you really sketch at all, is not always to make a pretty picture. All it's right. to understand in a, in a deep-seated way what you're seeing. So mm -hmm. um, Goethe said, you don't really understand a plant until you draw it. So for mm -hmm. me, it's vital for me, if I want to understand a sea star, to draw it first. There's many things sure. I become aware of as I'm processing it and drawing it. Right. So that was the goal. I came away with 26 underwater sketches. Cool. And I didn't bring samples of them okay. with me today. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I have to come back and show you. Yes, indeed. But the other thing that I got was hours of footage and oh. many photographs. Okay. And I think we have a couple of those. If you'll bring up the one that looks like icicles underwater, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. So I was very interested, wow. because of my science background, at looking at different habitats. And mm -hmm. this is one of the shallow habitats. What you're looking at is the anchor ice, like you saw in a previous image at the start of the program. Right. But this is a very different kind of anchor ice. You notice they're kind of like little bouquets underwater. Right. You can see the subsurface, you can see the actual sediment, and mm -hmm. then the 
Things that look like stalactites or chandeliers hanging from the under ice surface are brine channels. And those oh. happen as the fresh water sinks, melts, and sinks through the cracks in the ice. And as it hits the salt water, it freezes out. Oh. And they actually flow almost like upside down volcanoes. Huh. So in the picture, if you look really closely and squint, you'll see some spots up in the under ice uh, surface. Hey, maybe up in the upper very left-hand corner, there is a whole ecology that lives attached to the sea ice, and that sea ice goes out every year. So they have to move huh. for summer, and huh. they come back. Then if you look, I think this is not the greatest image to notice it, but there are sea creatures that have gotten lifted up by the anchor ice and attached to the under ice surface. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, they find a long, dead sea creature that comes up through the ice in another part of... Antarctica right. that could have started on the seafloor, not here because the sea ice goes out every year, but right. it's a very interesting thing that happens. Mm -hmm. There might be, is there one more image waiting for us to look at? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the, this, is, this is a typical view underwater. There are, two, there are two more images I think left. This is the view, sort of a long shot of the typical habitat. And the things I really want to point out to everyone that's tuning in today is that it is super clear underwater in yeah, Antarctica. Beautiful, beautiful clear water. It is like diving in space. Mm -hmm. I have made that analogy many times. I am in the foreground in the blue custom made dry suit. Mm -hmm. And I am busily distracted by something on the seafloor while a Waddell seal looks on. Remember I told mm -hmm, you right. they come on, every, they pretty much are on every dive. Yeah. And then in the background, if you look up at the sea ice surface, there's a couple things there I would like you to notice that are really cool. One is that there is something that looks like a full moon, a circle. Right. That is our dive hole. Okay. It's really important to keep your eye on that at all times, <laughs> but it's really easy to see. You right. can see how the surrounding yeah, so ice surface is kind of dark, right. so it glows like the moon. Yeah. And that bright patch to the left of that round full moon hole is our breathing hitting the under ice surface. And what's interesting about that, I mentioned that there's a whole ecology attached to the mm -hmm. sea ice. There are diatoms that grow on the under ice surface. And as the sun approaches 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. those diatoms, diatoms start going crazy. And it's an algae, right. so it's kind of a brown color. And they start growing on the under ice surface. So when we do our safety stop and stay in one place and our bubbles hit the under ice surface, we make these clear ah, spots. So that's what you're seeing in that image. I wish we had time to go further, <laughs> but we, I'm told we are out of time Fantastic. here. Fantastic. Kirsten, thank you so much for coming back here and sharing your wonderful, beautiful art with us. Pleasure. And uh, I, I hope you can get back another time too. Yes. And we'll, we'll dig even deeper into this. And I hope you will come back and join us next time on Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Until then.